Thank you very much, Judy, for the generous introduction. And I also owe a note of sincere thanks at the honor of being here as a Radcliffe Fellow this year to Liz Cohen, who's here in the back, uh, Rebecca Haley, who helps uh, keep us in order, and of course to Susan and Kenneth L. Wallach for sponsoring the professorship that I hold. It's been a welcome time to delve into the sources necessary to begin a new project on procedure in early Islamic law and society, and it wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So thank you to them, and thanks to all of you for coming here. So the title of my talk, as you know, is Qadi Justice, Cases and Controversies in Early Islamic Law and Society. I'll spend the bulk of my time unpacking three such cases and controversies in an attempt to better map the content and significance of procedure to early Islamic law. Somewhat tongue in cheek, I call this project Qadi Justice, where Qadi simply means judge in Arabic. And I say tongue in cheek because there's a story behind this term. Max Weber defined Qadi Justice, uh, spelled in the proper German way. He defined it as an arbitrary judge sitting under a palm tree, dispensing justice according to whim. And he may have gotten this notion from reading Arabian Nights as a manual for Islamic law. Or perhaps, more charitably, he believed the conventional narratives of Muslim scholars themselves. For them, the claim was that Islamic law was, in fact, an unchanging sacred law that descended from on high and tended, they tended to discuss it in terms of substantive legal rulings in their manuals, and they didn't pay much attention to procedure. If Islam had a system where the law was all text and no procedure, then a judge might indeed have to decide cases by whim. There'd be no escape valve otherwise, as Weber supposed. But I have evidence to suggest precisely the opposite in ways that may make us redefine Islamic law itself. My main contention is that judges developed robust procedures to help define Islamic law in response to changing social and political circumstances during Islam's founding period, by which I refer to the, the long founding period from the 7th to 11th centuries. These procedures were part and parcel of Islamic law, even though they are rarely contained in its manuals. So before elaborating on that claim, I'll point out that the old Weberian notion of Islamic law, this Qadi justice, the judge sitting under a tree, it's unfortunately uh, the case that it dangerously persists today, as many who subscribe to or comment on Islamic law tend to believe that it is somehow divinely determined and therefore static. So let me start with the first case, which highlights the role of procedure and change through a notion of, a, of the Islamic law of doubt. This curious episode in early Islamic history illustrates the problems posed by doubt in Islamic criminal law. And I'll call it the case of the falsely accused butcher. Not long after Islam's advent in the seventh century, a type of early police force in a small Arabian town was out patrolling. Members of the patrol came across a man in the town ruins holding a bloodstained knife in his hand and standing over the body of another man who had obviously just died or been killed. The patrol arrested the man with the knife and upon arrest he confessed, I killed him. The suspect was brought before Ali, the beloved cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad who had died less than three decades before that in, in 632. Ali was the fourth caliph, according to the Sunni account of successes to the Prophet, and he was the first imam in the competing Shi'i account. He presided over criminal trials in his capacity as leader of the young Muslim community from 656 to 661, as had the Prophet before him. And upon hearing the defendant's story, Ali reportedly sentenced him to death in accordance with the Islamic law of retaliation or of talion for homicide and personal injury, a life for a life. 
Before the sentence was carried out, another man rushed forward, telling the executioners, don't be so hasty. Don't kill him. I did it, he said. Ali turned to the condemned man incredulously. What, what made you confess to a crime that you didn't commit? The man explained that he thought Ali would never take his word over that of the patrolman who had perhaps witnessed the crime, or at least witnessed the crime scene, wherein, wherein all signs pointed to him as the perpetrator. In reality, the man explained, he was a butcher who had just finished slaughtering a cow. And immediately after the slaughter, he needed to relieve himself. So he entered into the town ruins, bloody knife still in hand. Upon return, he came across the dead man, and, and he actually stood over him in concern. It was then that the patrol encountered him, and figuring that he couldn't plausibly having, uh, deny having committed the crime, he confessed to what seemed to be obvious and decided to leave the matter in God's hands. The second man offered a corroborating story and explained that he was the one who had murdered the man for money and then fled upon hearing sounds of the patrol approaching. On his way out, he passed the butcher entering the area and then watched the events unfold just as the butcher had described them. Once the butcher was condemned to death, however, the second man felt compelled to step forward. He didn't want the blood of two men on his hands. So this episode, and again, we'll, we'll refer to it as the case of the falsely accused butcher, depicts the difficulties that early and medieval Muslim judges faced when attempting to apply Islamic criminal law without the benefit of being able to discern the facts, the law, or the morality of punishment with any certainty. As for the facts, confession or witness testimony usually sufficed to establish guilt in Islamic criminal laws of murder. But here, Ali, as judge, was presented only with circumstantial and eventually contradictory evidence. There were these competing confessions, which canceled each other out. And there was no witness testimony beyond the patrol that only witnessed the crime scene, not the actual crime itself. As for the Islamic law of homicide, the Quran and other foundational texts contain clear rules that retaliation applied only to intentional murder. But those rules didn't cover the case before Ali. There was no claim of premeditation, at least not for the butcher. And as for the morality, and consequently the legitimacy of punishment, Ali also had to decide whether to enforce or avoid the textual rule of punishment if he decided that it applied, in the face of procedural uncertainties about the law and the facts. And he chose to avoid punishment. Now the question is why and to what extent? And the answer is shrouded by a tangled web that took Muslim jurists centuries to weave and therefore takes serious historical work to unravel, which is what I do in my book that Judy mentioned, Doubt in Islamic Law. But don't worry, I won't spend the centuries unraveling that, uh, that story here. I'll cut to the center. Muslims developed a robust set of procedures that they believed were consistent with Islamic legal rules and values to make doubt and avoidance of punishment on its basis a central pillar of Islamic criminal law. So that's the book in the nutshell. And read it for more if you want to see how. So myriad episodes like the case of the falsely accused butcher recur in early Islamic legal sources. And Muslim jurists explain such cases consistently with respect to doubt. They took cases like this one as a precedent. And based on it, they then promoted a surprisingly extensive tendency of extending the benefit of the doubt to the accused. They packaged that tendency in the form of a legal maxim and oft repeated saying, whereby they counseled judges to avoid criminal punishments in cases of doubt. This was repeated over and over again. Avoid criminal punishments in cases of doubt. Avoid criminal punishments in cases of doubt. So I call this statement Islamic law's doubt canon. And it's one of many Islamic legal maxims that were rooted in past cases and in judicial practices from those past cases as a way of 
elaborating a procedural rule that became part and parcel of Islamic law. And it's part of Islamic law, I argue, even though it manifests less as texts in the law books and more as procedure in the form of legal practice that comes from other sources, which I'll, I'll discuss. Now, one more note about doubt uh, before we, we move on. For anyone familiar with American criminal law, I should note that the Arabic term for doubt in this canon, shubha, was a term of art. And that's, uh, you have a handout, that's the first term on the handout. And I'll, you can ignore it thereafter, and I'll tell you when you can, you can pick it up uh, again. It assumed a much more expansive meaning than the common conception of reasonable doubt that we have in American law. So rather than presenting a principally fact-based approach uh, to standards of proof, the Islamic doctrine covered factual uncertainties, legal ambiguities, even extra-legal considerations that I call moral doubt. And moreover, the Islamic doctrine of doubt corresponds to analogous American doctrines as seemingly disparate as the principle of legality, the rule of lenity, which instructs judges to construe criminal statutes narrowly in cases of doubt, the presumption of innocence, the requirement for proof beyond a reasonable doubt as to the facts, mens rea requirements, or the state of mind having to be criminal before criminal culpability can be assigned, mistake, ignorance, impossibility, and other potentially mitigating circumstances, and even mercy. And the concept of shubha, or doubt in Islamic law, also covered notions unique to Islamic law. There's a notion of contractual doubt, uh, whereby a contract could create a cause for doubt as to criminal liability, and of interpretive doubt, whereby multiple legal interpretations that were considered equally valid, yet different in Islamic law, could also create a cause for doubting whether a criminal sanction would apply in one circumstance where the underlying act would have been permissible uh, in, in another school of thought. And we can talk more about that. OK, so why should we care about doubt or the role of procedure to which it points? This current project on Qadi justice, which seeks to elucidate the role of procedure in early Islamic law, grows out of that earlier project on doubt. So in the book, Doubt in Islamic Law, which was published earlier this year, um, I uncovered what turns out to have been a long history of discretion and doubt in Islamic criminal law, as I just described. But the fact that I publish a book on the subject is not the reason we should care about the Islamic history of doubt um, or about the judicial procedures that grew out of it. Instead, I submit that the that procedure is important here because it reveals an under-recognized, but I think all important aspect of Islamic legal history that may redefine notions of Islamic law itself. Now, that seems like a grand claim, it is. But let me explain what I mean by that with respect to both modern and political developments, uh, or modern political de developments uh, and scholarly debates concerning Islamic law. And, and I'm more concerned with the scholarly debates um, as a historian, so it will be my focus. But I want to say something about the modern political relevance as well. So as for the modern political developments, the history of doubt and procedure matters for ongoing questions of Islamic law today. For starters, Islamic law has re-emerged in the past half century in constitutional and in criminal contexts. Since the 1970s, over 29 countries have incorporated an Islamic law or Sharia clause into their constitutional texts, a clause saying Islamic law shall be a source or the source of law, or they've announced intentions to do so, as has the Gambia just a few days ago. And during the same period, at least a dozen states have passed Islamic criminal law codes or applied Islamic criminal law in various regions. And these countries range from Iran, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia to provinces in Malaysia, northern Nigeria, and now in Syria. 
In each country, there are raging debates about the definitions of Islamic law and the role for doubt or discretion in criminal law. And to be sure, many of those who seek to apply Islamic law, and particularly Islamic criminal law in these areas, adopt ill-conceived and ahistoric versions of rigidly harsh Islamic criminal law, particularly in places like uh, northern Nigeria, Mali, Iraq. And the barbarism that results from this ignorant application has prompted, more than anything, fears of Islam's punishments or Islamic law more generally. In fact, those punishments have sometimes come to define the face of Sharia itself. It's often left untra untranslated in order to highlight its exoticism and the danger that it can evoke. So the book called into question this erroneous but popular notion of Islamic law, which incidentally is upheld by many Muslim adherents and non-Muslim critics alike. And to put that in more vivid terms, you might say that the ISIS leader and Donald Trump or Ben Carson <coughs> share an idea of what Sharia is. The notion is that Islamic law is a divine legal tradition with little room for discretion or doubt. And what I uh, want to intervene and say is that despite the contemporary popularity um, of that notion, it turns out, based on research to date, to have been far outside the mainstream of Islamic law for most of its history. And the surprising reality is that, as we saw in the aftermath of the case of the falsely accused butcher, instead of rejecting doubt, historically Muslim scholars embraced it and they came to hold it so closely that it came to be at the heart of Islamic criminal law. And through the doubt canon, and here's uh, where the new project comes in, it was Islamic criminal procedure that came to be central to notions of Islamic criminal law itself. And that was manifested through this maxim here, the doubt canon, avoid criminal punishments in cases of doubt. So in the political and policy arenas today, this history is significant not only to further our understanding of a forgotten notion of doubt in early Islamic law, but because of the importance for early Islamic law to modern interpretations, in many ways akin to conservative visions of the American legal tradition. Islamic law is a textualist and originalist legal tradition. Appeals to Islamic law are really appeals to the founding moment or founding history of Islamic law in which directives from the prophet and from other authoritative figures were most authoritative, just like references to the American founding fathers carry some weight in debates about American constitutional and statutory interpretation. So, so that's a word about the political and policy significance of discretion, doubt, and procedure. As for the scholarly debates about Islamic law, the history of uh, doubt and the role of procedure matters for gaining a better understanding of the nature of Islamic law during that founding period. Any misunderstanding, in my view, has to do with impoverished understandings of Islamic law from a narrow use of sources to enrich those understandings. So my approach combines the tools of a historian and a lawyer. Wearing both hats, I approach questions of interpretation in early Islamic law and society with insights from theories of constitutional and statutory interpretation, which is a field, at least in the American context, that's witnessed significant advances in the past few years or decades. So starting from two basic insights. One, that procedure is law and vice versa. And two, that interpretation helps define and manage institutional and social relations. I've been able to identify ways in which procedure and interpretation helped construct and were constructed by institutions, values, and social norms that inform Islamic legal rules. Moreover, by taking Islamic law as law, 
in the broad sense that modern lawyers understand law, and by thus examining a broad range of sources for Islamic law and society in its early period, my project speaks both to the nature of Islamic law and to theories of interpretation with which all legal systems are concerned, but which typically develop with respect only to American or Western legal traditions. So in that sense, I also aim for this project to help critique and expand our notions of procedure and of legal interpretation. My examination then of Qadi justice is necessary to round out the rather square notion of Islamic law in the books at the expense of the law in action, both for a more accurate understanding of Islam's early history and for a more expanded notion of modern legal theory in comparative contexts. So with that long introduction to the subject, I'll proceed within, within the remainder of the talk as follows. In part one, I'll lay out some basic building blocks that will help map the players, the legal sources, and the institutional structures that are integral to understanding Islamic law and so that you have some blocks to play with, as it were. In part two, I'll give an example, I'm sorry, in, in part three, I'll give an example of a case from a literary source in 10th century Baghdad that exemplifies problems of caliphal excesses in punishment to which the jurists writing about doubt and procedure and developing procedure were responding. And then in part four, I'll circle back to the question of the sources for this current project and the importance of an expanded set of sources to better understanding the scope and content and operation of Islamic law in its early period with respect to procedure. What is the availability, significance, and use of this wide range of sources for developing the early history of Islamic law through a focus on actual cases, or reported, I should say, reported cases and controversies? In short, I'll argue that these cases are important not for their historical truth value, but to uncover the legal aims to which jurists put them, and to chart how and why judicial procedure emerged from certain developments in early Islamic law and society that they represent. And, and this last part is essentially a precy or a, a, a mini version of the project that I'm working on this year, and so I very much welcome comments in that vein. So on to part two, the basic building blocks of Islamic law. And here's where your handouts come in handy. There are two basic building blocks that lay the foundation on which medieval Muslim jurists, the main players, historically constructed Islamic law and procedure. The textual sources and the institutional structures. As for the textual sources, there is the Quran, which is Muslim scripture. And this is a picture of one first century Hijri or seventh century manuscript. And Hadith, or prophetic reports of the words and actions of Muhammad. Now Muslims believe that Muhammad was a prophet who received revelations directly from God and that he recorded the Quran during his lifetime in the seventh century. And so this is the first textual source of Islamic law, its constitutional text. In addition, early Muslims recorded the Prophet's statements in multiple books collecting thousands of prophetic reports over the course of two centuries. And so this forms a second textual source. Now significantly, None of these sources were uh, of the second type were contained in a single book. There's no single law code. There are thousands of reports that were gathered over the course of time. Now Muslims took Muhammad's statement to be normative sources of Islamic law when he issued those statements in his capacity as a divinely inspired prophet and when they could ascertain the authenticity of these multitude of sources that they were recording some decades and in some cases centuries after the Prophet's death. 
But they didn't look to his, uh, to these statements as normative sources where the authenticity could not be ascertained or where he was speaking in his personal capacity, for example, expressing preferences uh, that had little to do with law. In his personal capacity, even he was bound to the rules of the divine law. And the thorny task then for Hadith scholars and for jurists dealing with such a fluid textual corpus was distinguishing the personal from the prophetic and the authentic from those falsely attributed. Now, Muslims also believe that God legislated a comprehensive set of laws through these two textual sources, the Quran and Hadith. Those laws included a short list of fixed criminal laws, and that's hudud, uh, the third on your list. And these fixed criminal laws were also supposed to provide the upper limits of punishment for any discretionary penalties that a caliph rather than a judge might impose. The idea was that criminal law, more starkly than other areas of law, expressed Islam's absolute form of divine legislative supremacy. God was the sole legislator, so legislator with a big L. Um, and he tolerated no departure from the text. In the textualist, strict, constructionist version of Islamic law, divine legislative supremacy meant applying Islamic criminal laws broadly whenever there was some text and some evidence to suggest cause for punishment and otherwise to suspend judgment altogether. And this approach stood in stark contest, contrast to the one that won out through the doubt canon and the development of procedure through it. And that was the push to construe text narrowly in the style of the rule of lenity in American law whenever there were ambiguities that arose from applications of law to facts. And it also cautioned judges to avoid conviction and punishment in the style of reasonable doubt in American law when the evidence was questionable to proving the claim with absolute certainty. So this brings us to the second building block, the institutional structures. Historically, Islamic governments, like all pre-modern governments, did not have three constitutionally defined separate branches of power. Um, they often did not have constitutions. Uh, instead, there was an informal constitutional arrangement that unfolded in the Islamic context after the Prophet's death in 632. In this scheme, a class of scholar jurists asserted the authority to interpret Islamic law, to say what the law is and monarchical rulers called caliphs enforced it. Now between the two, there were judges whom the caliph appointed, but who looked to the jurists for definitions of Islamic law. In some sense, the jurists were learned scholars of, of the law, much like professors. But unlike professors, Muslim jurist definitions of Islamic law actually mattered. They were crucial for uh, definitions of Islamic law itself and for questions of legitimacy. So this much is now well known in the literature. We have a basic outline of three institutions. We have the jurists and, and their actors. We have the jurists, the judges, and the caliphs. Um, but the existing scholarship does not give us a full picture of how Muslim jurists expanded their discretion over Islamic law and how they did so with respect to procedures informed by the social and political realities of their times. So this is a part of the picture that I seek to fill in with reference to the cases and controversies uh, from the early period. And to that end, I argue that in response to cases like the case of uh, the falsely accused butcher, Muslim jurists of the time uh, appeal to authoritative cases to identify, define, and expand procedures to better guide legitimate criminal punishment. So to add some color to that claim, I'll use a 10th century case that inspired judges of the time to construct and better articulate procedures uh, based on the more authoritative cases like the falsely accused butcher case 
from the 7th century and just after. Now, I said I wanted to add some more color, and the 10th century case is actually really colorful. It's called The Case of the Tailor and Military Sexual Misconduct. It's essentially two cases wrapped up in one, and the first case has to do with debt repayment. Now, in the eastern section of Baghdad sometime in the late 1900s, and Baghdad was a round city that had four quadrants at the time, an elder merchant came to the local judge, Qadi Abu al-Hassan and al hashimi to demand repayment of a debt from one of the soldiers. The soldier had been avoiding repayment, and every time the merchant went to demand it, there would be a guard at the soldier's home brushing off the request. So even if the judge could issue a decision declaring that payment was due, he had no authority to enforce the decision or to force payment. And accordingly, he had to submit a complaint to the caliphal court of al-Mu'tadid, the caliph at the time, for enforcement. The vizier, who worked under the caliph and who first entertained such claims, Ubaid Allah bin Sulaiman, received the complaint, but he didn't do anything about it. So the case seemed hopeless, as if there was no justice to be had. The judge applying Islamic law might have entered a judgment requiring, re requiring repayment, but he lacked enforcement authority. The caliph's vizier, uh, who did have enforcement authority, ignored the complaint. And it seemed that the soldier was to be left to do exactly as he pleased. But then a friend of the merchant intervened, presumably one of the officials of the town. And he directed him to a local tailor. The tailor, upon hearing the case, accompanied that merchant and the official to the soldier's house, and they were immediately well received. The soldier said, come in, how can I help? Um, what can I do for you? And the tailor told him the story that the merchant had recounted to him. Immediately, the soldier offered to give uh, whatever money he had. All I have is 5,000 dirhams or silver coins. Please ask him to accept that, he said to the tailor along with these uh, riding reins made of gold and silver as, as my security deposit until I can come up with the rest. And so the merchant took possession of both and he was satisfied. Now, back at the ranch, or the tailor shop to be more precise, um, of course the merchant wanted to know what was up with the tailor. Um, why had the tailor held such sway over this otherwise obstinate and intransigent soldier? And so the tailor rather reluctantly told the story uh, as follows, and this is the second case, the really, colorful, the really colorful case of the tailor and the military sexual misconduct. So the tailor had been the prayer leader at the local mosque, again in this eastern section of Baghdad, uh, near to his tailoring shop for over 40 years. And so one day, on his home from, way home from work, he passed by a drunken Turkish soldier and saw him grab a beautiful young woman who was just passing by his home. And he forced her into his house. She called out for help. No one was around to respond. And so the tailor took it upon himself to help. He knocked on the door. He kindly asked the soldier to let the woman go. And in response, he got hit on the head with a mace and almost got knocked out. So the tailor slowly made his way back to the mosque to pray the late evening prayer. And when he was done, he tried to rally all those in attendance to go confront the Turkish soldier and to free the woman. The group agreed, and they went to the soldier's door, and then mayhem ensued. The soldier came out flanked by a number of soldiers around him, and they all began beating up this group of people who had just come from the mosque. And they again hit the poor tailor in the head, um, this time injuring him even more. He barely recovered, barely made it home. So the tailor was uh, annoyed, to say the least. And so he thought, what, what can I do? So he devised a scheme. I bet if I were to make the call to prayer early, the call to the dawn prayer, the Turkish soldier, who was clearly drunk, would think the dawn had come, in which case he would release the woman, not wanting to be seen with her in the light of day. Then he figured 
That would be the lesser of two evils. Both uh, actions were considered impermissible, either him calling, making the call to prayer outside of its appointed time, um, or uh, allowing a woman to be raped by this soldier. Of the two, he figured it was a lesser uh, sin to call the prayer, call for prayer outside of its appointed time. And he may have had another scheme in mind as well. Because the police chief immediately asks why this man had made this untimely call to prayer and commanded that he go see the caliph immediately. So it was just as the tailor wanted, perhaps. He got an audience with the caliph, who actually had power. The caliph, al mutadid asks, well, why did you make the call to prayer at the time that you did? And the tailor recounted the whole story, um, to which the caliph then ordered the police chief to summon the Turkish soldier and the woman immediately. The woman was questioned separately, and she confirmed the tale or the narrative of events that the tailor had told. And then the soldier was asked about what happened. And even he confirmed the narrative of events. And so the caliph looked at him and said, well, are all the stipends and the land and the position that you have from being a senior soldier insufficient to stop you from committing acts of disobedience against God and from compromising my power and my authority? And the soldier was at a loss, unable to give an answer. The caliph then ordered that he be shackled, beaten, and eventually had him executed and thrown into the Tigris River. The caliph concluded by saying to the tailor, O oh, Sheikh, this a term for wise man, any wrongs you see? whether large or small, even if it's against this person, and he pointed to his police chief, please don't pass by it, but stop by and, and forbid it. And if anything happens to you or is not accepted from you, or if anyone violates the law, the signal between us will be that you'll make the call to prayer at a time like this, and I will hear your voice and summon you and do what I've just done to whoever does not agree with you. So news of this incident and the caliph's admonition spread amongst the local officials and the soldiers alike. And from that day onward, never did this tailor ask them for anything, uh, whether to enforce the law or to cease violating the law, except that they obeyed him without question and with a great amount of deference in the same way that the soldier displayed when asked to repay the merchant's debt. And the tailor concluded the case saying, and never have I needed to make an untimely call to prayer again. So such was the case. Where does the case come from? Instead of an archive of court records, which do not exist for this early period, the case comes from a literary source. It's contained in one of the works of the famous judge and literary critic who hailed from Baghdad in modern-day Iraq. His name was Qadi Abu, Abu Ali al-Muhassan al-Tanukhi, who died in 994. And this judge came from a well-known family of judges. judges uh, judgeships seemed to be hereditary. And they worked closely with the Abbasid caliphs in Baghdad and in surrounding lands. He thus had a front row seat to unfolding uh, plays of law and society in both law courts and in royal courts. So he's known less for his explicitly legal works than he is for his literary compilations. And those, those literary compilations are all court-focused anecdotes that provide rich insight into uh, themes of early Islamic law and society. There are two books in particular that are important. One is the book called Relief After Adversity, uh, Al-Faraj Ba'd al-Shidda. And the second has been translated as Table Talk of a Mesopotamian Judge, Nishwar al-Muhadara. Both of these are at the bottom of your sheet um, under literary sources. So these works aren't unique to Tanuki, this judge. The first known author of the genre was Ibn Abi ad-Dunya, who died in 894. And he wrote 
collecting cases and controversies of relief after adversity, this Faraj Ba'd al-Shidda, over a century before. But Tanukhi's work is the most well-known in, in the genre. It's the most expansive, and it's the best preserved. And according to Tanukhi himself in these works, he wrote down, uh, or he compiled the work based on written and oral informants and included stories about contemporary officials, judges, and other acquaintances in, in the courts. So worth noting here is that this source and the case it depicts are atypical sources of Islamic law, unlike that of the falsely accused butcher from Islam's founding period, which is found in some of the early foundational texts. But I want to suggest that this case and other cases like it nevertheless did affect the jurists of the time and the construction of Islamic law and procedure. And, and, they, and it did so through affecting the readings of the earlier, more precedential cases. From my reading of multiple sources, it seems that the judges or the jurists circulating in 10th century Baghdad, where these events reportedly unfolded, um, they were disturbed by at least three aspects of the case. First, there was the marked departure from Islamic law and the marked lack of procedure. It was apparent in the underlying case, the debt repayment case, that the judge had no discretion or, or no authority to enforce the law of debt repayment. And more significantly, in the second case of the tailor and the, and the military sexual misconduct, the caliphal court did not appeal to the judge or to any Muslim jurist to decide the fate of the soldier. He didn't apply any particularly robust procedures. Um, and he didn't seem to follow uh, Islamic law at all. So second, the caliph asserted absolute authority then over the law in ways that were at odds with the basic building blocks of Islamic law that we, that we covered. And those basic building blocks were important because they undergirded the entire system of legitimacy for the caliph himself. If he wasn't implying Islamic law as defined by the jurists, then he didn't have justification or legitimacy to his rule. And, and that's just a statement of the, the settled uh, understanding of the sources of legitimacy for, for early caliphs. And then third, and, and perhaps most importantly, the case arguably exemplifies caliphal excesses and punishment to which the response was jurist construction of procedures um, at that time based on earlier cases. So in executing the man without what we might call Islamic due process, the caliph was at odds with all authorized Islamic punishments for the crimes involved, that theft or failure to repay debt, personal injury, and rape. Um, and, and his concern had more to do with protecting his own authority than it had to do with ensuring the Islamic law basis for public order. And this was the thing that was unacceptable to the jurists operating at that time. They responded by articulating robust criminal procedures to counter the caliphal excesses in punishment. So in, in short, the case is important not for its historic value uh, as, as to what actually happened, but for the interpretive output that it bore in the 10th century with respect to early cases. It was used to define the very procedure with respect to ongoing controversies that emerge from episodes like the case of the tailor and other cases. And obviously, this is a literary, from a literary source. And, and so um, it's not a report, most likely, of an, of an actual case. But taken in the aggregate, such cases uh, reported in these sources and others give us an idea of the types of, of controversies that were live at the time. And they buttress, uh, and, and judges in response used it to buttress the importance of procedure for Islamic legitimacy. When the new rulers in the 10th century pressed for execution orders or to otherwise violate Islamic law, as they did in the case of the tailor, the procedures that the jurists articulated in response could be used by judges to say that their hands were tied by Islamic law, understood not just as text, 
but as text and procedures that would prevent such executions. So with that background, we're equipped to circle back to the question of the sources for this overall project on Qadi justice, in which I seek to map the extent and growth of procedure. So returning to the question I earlier posed, what is the availability, significance, and use of a wide range of sources for developing the early history of Islamic law through the sort of focus on cases and controversies? In the doubt project, I got an inkling of the significance and growth of procedure in the course of uncovering an obscured history of discretion and doubt in Islamic criminal law. This project on Qadi justice builds on that one with a more direct look at the significance of procedure and the challenges it poses to our understanding of the meaning and operation of early Islamic law in criminal law, but in other legal contexts as well. And more specifically in this project, I will further explore the development of procedure and the ways in which it informs the use or inform the use of discretion in contexts that span criminal law, family law, and commercial law. And I do so by appealing to a wider range of sources than does the typical Islamic law scholar in order to gain a richer sense of the social and legal history. And in that vein, uh, it, it, it is in that vein that the cases and controversies that we've discussed today help provide vivid examples of my overarching claim. And that is that judges developed a robust set of procedures to help define Islamic law in response to changing social and political circumstances during Islam's founding period. And these procedures, moreover, were part and parcel of Islamic law itself, even though they're rarely contained in the early Islamic law books or manuals. So let me end then by stepping back even farther from the particular subject matter at hand to lay out the larger picture into which this project on Qadi justice fits. And, and I'll say then a word about uh, law and society. So scholars of law and society commonly divide up the world into spheres of law on the books, and law in action. And the dichotomy refers to connections and disjunctions between rules contained in legislation and other legal documentation on the one hand and to real world events on the other hand. How is the administration of justice affected by considerations like access to courts, social status, political context? And reflexively, how do these considerations affect how laws are made and modified in the Islamic context? So answers to these questions are essential for rounding out the frame of any legal system beyond its skeletal composition written on the pages of the law books. And they're also the very questions underlying debates about the nature of law, and particularly Islamic law, to the extent that this is a religious legal system that is in fact constructed, I argue, by varied institutions and evolving social norms, despite the claims to divine legal origins and authority. Our contemporary view of courts and of the lines connecting them to society to help shape early Islamic legal history, it's hazy at best. This book project on Qadi justice aims to sharpen those lines by examining the inner workings of the courts and the administration of justice in Abbasid, Baghdad, and surrounding lands during this early period of Islamic law. And the core aims are to investigate the extent to which judges constructed a regular set of procedures, often in the form of legal maxims, as we saw in the criminal law context in the doubt canon, which in turn help construct the operation of law. The aim is also to better identify ways in which judges drew on evolving societal norms to inform their conceptions and their use of both procedure and law or procedure as law. And finally, it's to gauge the extent of continuity and change in the functional use of procedure as law over time and place. 
So to be sure, this approach differs radically from the conventional narrative. As I, as I noted earlier, the typical understanding of Islamic law is that it's a sacred law, in the words of Max Weber, which cannot change through human interpretation. And indeed, Muslim judges and jurists themselves claim simply to execute divine legal texts. But then again, what judge doesn't? The United States Supreme Court justices claim not to insert their own preferences or to allow extra legal considerations into the law, uh, preferring to simply call balls and strikes, as Chief Justice John Roberts said during his confirmation hearings. Scholars of constitutional law, <coughs> legislation, and statutory interpretation, however, have applied insights from legal realism and legal process, uh, critical theory, game theory, and public choice, um, and the lessons of, of historical method to expose the fallacy of neutrality, uh, the neutrality claim in American law. And my book project seeks to apply those same basic insights and definitions of law to the different structures, histories, and origins of Islamic law with a focus on the construction of law through procedure and other social norms. So in conclusion, in the end, I'm in a sense arguing for a redefinition of Islamic law. Against conventional narratives of it, I contend that Islamic law is not just a range, a narrow range of texts or textual rules, but that it's a, it's, it includes a robust set of procedures central to the actual definition and operation of Islamic law. And I further claim that those procedures and thus the law itself were dynamic both developed in response to institutional and social contexts, and they changed over time. Uh, many we find elucidated in some of the sources we have for early cases and controversies that judges and jurists use to construct Islamic law. The fact that procedures often fail to make their way into the normative legal law book should not obscure the historical fact of their existence or of their prominence historically. And this becomes clear only if one examines a wider array of sources for Islamic law than has been done previously, the way historians and lawyers are trained to do. If this revised notion of Qadi justice that I tackle in this new project means anything, it calls for rethinking the methods and thus the history and content of Islamic law to encompass more sources and more procedure. Thank you. Thank you.